the origins of man. I, I mean, it's kind of a steady uh, theme, isn't it? We started off with, is it, you know, where did we all, where did it come from? The Big Bang, you know, was it something out of nothing when we came from, you know, we started there, and now we're just kind of progressing along. And, uh, and so tonight we're going to get into Buried Clues, is the, is the name of the, is the session. Lee, can you bring up the slide deck, please? All right. So from Genesis 7, 21, and all flesh died that moved on the earth and all mankind. So tonight we're, we're, we're in Genesis still, obviously, because we're unlocking Genesis. And, uh, but we're in chapter 7. And uh, if, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's the flood account. And um, chapter uh, 7, verse 21, uh, well, actually 19 and through, through to about 20, the end of actually chapter 7, just describes the, uh, the beginning of the flood account and, um, and how long the waters were on the earth. And the fact that the earth was covered with water. And it goes on to say that the highest mountains were covered uh, I think it was 15 cubits were covered. And if there's any scientists out there that know what a cubit is, does anybody know what the length of a cubit? 18 inches, roughly. 18 inches. So 15 cubits. So 15 times 18, it's a little bit more than, more, a couple more than two or three feet, right? right. It was, they were covered. Um, so it's important to understand that because there's a lot of folks out there that are going to talk about, you know, uh, well, it wasn't covered, or was everything underwater, or it really wasn't underwater, or just parts of the earth were underwater. Well, the whole earth was underwater. And we're going to find out how that impacts tonight's lesson about buried clues, because, uh, the, you know, the scientists, they talk about how the earth was formed and the different layers and why we see things at different layers. Well, the Bible tells us something different. And so... Uh, Marcus, I think that's the, the guy that is narrating with us. He's going to show us something different tonight. So, Lee, could you start the video for us, please? The mystery and the history of the Earth. What secrets lie beneath its surface? What clues has it left about its past, about our past, about where we come from and how we got here? and when. Fossils are the only hard evidence that can help us understand what life existed in the distant past. Could the stories we've been told about the distant past be a miscalculation? More importantly, why does it matter? What do the remnants of the past tell us about the direction we are headed? I'm Marcus Lloyd, and welcome to Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. As science and technology advance, we're discovering that the ancient text of the Bible contains more truth in it than we've ever imagined. In this series, we examine the evidence from geology, astronomy, biology, and other fields of science to see if the data supports what the Bible says about our origins. But where besides the Bible do we find answers for the really big questions? Ones like, who am I? What am I? How did I get here? Can science really provide answers to the deepest questions of life? Well, there is a way of digging up the evidence and finding the truth. Today, we've come to Dinosaur National Monument to explore rocks and fossils, to learn what secrets they reveal and what the science really means. Many dinosaur fossils, like this bone of a sauropod, can be found here, but there are lots more.
In fact, dinosaur fossils are so abundant here that this exhibit hall was built around a huge rock wall containing approximately 1,500 dinosaur bones. Let's check it out. Here's one way of looking at the science of fossils. Pictures have a way of telling the story of our lives, whether it's a family album or a pic you send your friends. Fossils are kind of an Instagram, a moment in time captured and posted on the page of Earth's history. But what are fossils? And what do they really tell us? Fossils are kind of a freeze frame in time, a snapshot of the past that gives us a glimpse of life, prolific life that once populated the Earth. But does it explain the origins of that life? Well, can a snapshot of your life explain who you really are, how you got there and what you did? What does a fossil snapshot actually reveal? And how can what's missing reveal everything? One of the main tools evolutionary scientists have used to promote evolution has been the fossil record. All the fossils which lie buried in rock formations in the sedimentary layers or strata of the Earth. As you go deeper into the Earth, the normal assumption is that you go deeper in time. There are 23 layers of strata here in Dinosaur National Monument, many of which expose fossils that provide a glimpse into this hidden past. When you look at which fossils are buried in which layer, you supposedly get a picture of how life evolved. From the simplest organisms buried in the deepest layers to more complex and recent organisms like dinosaurs, most evolutionists believe that this process is a very slow and gradual one. Since change would have happened very gradually, there should theoretically be transitional forms in the fossil record that show a major body change between primitive versions of an organism and more complex versions, such as the creature that's somewhere between a fish with fins and an amphibian with legs. Let's investigate one of the more famous examples. Darwin was uh, pretty, uh, pretty frustrated at the first publication of The Origin of Species, and he was hopeful that there would be evidence to support his theory. They hadn't really dug deeply into the fossil record uh, by that point, and so they were all looking for hard evidence that would support his contentions. And so Archaeopteryx was hailed as a wonderful find, a feathered dinosaur, a very important transitional form between dinosaurs and birds. So there are things we know about Archaeopteryx that cause us to question it as a true transitional species. Dinosaurs were all over the planet. We find their remains all around the world. If Archaeopteryx was the progenitor to modern birds, why is it only found in Germany? Why isn't it found in deposits all over the world? Um, the other important thing is that uh, true modern birds have been found in strata older than the strata that Archaeopteryx came out of. So if it is the true progenitor to birds, why are there modern birds buried deeper in the fossil layer than Archaeopteryx? But what exactly is it? Evolutionary scientists still can't agree. Is it a reptile with feathers or a bird with teeth? Can it only be interpreted as a missing link? What does this fossil, or any fossil, actually reveal? It all depends on how you look at it. We all tend to have our favorite scenes from films. It could be an action scene, maybe a funny scene, or even a romantic scene. For some, they just love the last scene of a happy ending. But you can't keep watching the same scene from a movie and expect to know the whole story. So what story is the fossil record telling? Even now, there are some secular scientists who admit that the evolutionist narrative is more than proving a theory of origins. It's a belief system. Dr. Michael Ruse, a world-renowned philosopher of science and staunch atheist, admits that evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. He goes on to describe himself as an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian. And he says and admits that in this one complaint, the literalists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. So does the fossil record provide an evolutionary picture of the past? Some secular scientist, perhaps unwittingly, 
have begun to challenge the theory of evolution. Well, evolutionists have traditionally thought that evolution went gradually and that gradually a fish changed into an amphibian and changed into a mammal and, and on up. But uh, where are these transitional forms? Well, Stephen Jay Gould at Harvard was a thoroughgoing evolutionist and a, an expert in the fossil record. He noted that the fossil record really doesn't document Darwinian change. He said, what we find is one type of animal here, and then we find another type of animal here. Now, we know that they evolved, but there's no evidence that they evolved. He proposed a new theory called punctuated equilibrium, that the the basic equilibrium that we see today in, in life forms, stasis, thing, things staying the way they are. He says, no, they, that equilibrium was interrupted by punctuations with maybe a change in the environment or something and, and that it happened rapidly. It happened so rapidly that it went from fish to amphibian and left no fossils. The fact is we find no fossils. The views of Gould, Eldridge, and Stanley stirred up quite a bit of debate among evolutionists. It just goes to show that even evolutionary scientists don't always agree on what the fossils are telling us. Perhaps what they believe affects what they see. So we've come back to this. Here we can see what digging up the past can show us, but what's equally important is what it doesn't show. And how can something that is not there sometimes be more important than what is? Let's put the evidence on trial and see. When lawyers enter a courtroom, they're required to do one thing, fully present their case before a jury. When a jury is sequestered for deliberations, they're required to come to a decision based not on their emotions about the case, but on one question. What does the evidence show? So let's step aside from emotional arguments about science and religion, and just take a look at what the facts show and what seems the most logical. Let me present Exhibit A. Diversity. The evidence indicates a tremendous diversity of life. Thousands upon thousands of examples of fossils, all preserved with few, if any, sign of decay. How could this happen? Dead animals don't usually turn into fossils. So what forces could have created such near perfect preservation? Well, a very rapid burial of these creatures. So rapid that they don't even have time to decay or end up as a scavenger's dinner. When we look at the evidence, what else do we discover? Exhibit B, stability, or stasis as scientists call it. There is fully formed prolific life captured in the fossil record. Life that shows complexity and completeness. And it's a record from which, strangely enough, the transitional forms of life are missing. Amid all that diversity and complexity, there is no undisputed evidence that shows one species transitioning into another. It seems that what the fossil record doesn't reveal could be just as important as what it does. Let's suppose we want to prove there's been a murder, and we come before a judge looking for a guilty verdict. Well, before you can even come to trial, you have to have actual evidence that there's been a murder. But what if you had no body? no murder weapon, and no witnesses. The jury is duty bound to go with the preponderance of the evidence. If there's no body, no weapon, and no witnesses, the jury would most likely conclude no murder. The case would be dismissed. You see, the evidence we don't find in the fossil record, like decay from exposure and transitional forms, is every bit as important as what we do find. Just like the jury in our dismissed murder case, scientists are also called in to follow the evidence. Without data, all you have is a theory. In every textbook on this, they always produce not only the evolutionary tree of simple going to complex and all, but they also produce a geologic column. The fossils as they're presented go simple to complex, simple one-celled animals down at the bottom and then mammals, man, up at the top. This simple evolutionary picture of simple to complex it really isn't the story of the fossil record. What you see is complexity at every stage. You do not see this simple to complex change. Uh, that's the story of evolution, but it's not the story of the fossils. The fossils show complexity and design and sudden appearance all along the way. The lowest strata, the Precambrian layer, consists of several geologic eons and contains very few fossils. 
And then there's a period of time at the beginning of the Paleozoic era where ancient life seems to have simply exploded. The fossil record suddenly goes from showing fossils of relative simplicity to an overabundance of fossils showing great diversity and increasing complexity. This is commonly referred to as the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian layer gives evidence of a sudden proliferation of life forms that were not present in the previous layer. So, from the Precambrian to the Cambrian layers, you go from very few fossils to a great abundance of fossils, yet no transitional fossils in between. Where are the simpler transitional forms that should be mixed in this rock-hard record? If they exist, they should be found in rock layers that are lower, therefore older. They're just not there. And if you look carefully at the geologic strata in the Grand Canyon, for instance, there are, according to an evolutionary worldview, huge gaps in time between some of the layers. Meaning whole layers of geologic time have gone missing. Either the layers were never deposited or were eroded away. These gaps are called unconformities. And even secular scientists have a hard time explaining where these missing layers went. They admit that the fossil record is incomplete in the Grand Canyon. If Grand Canyon is this stack of pancakes, well, this pancake is dated by their methods, and, and they're thought to be, this is the youngest, this is the oldest. But in reality, they, this one might be 350 million years old, and this is 310 million years ago. There's, oh, there's what, 40 million years in between these two layers. There's no evidence of streams going through here and eroding a stream gulch, or there's no evidence of trees and their roots penetrating, or there's no worms burrowing, or there's no, I mean, there's nothing happening for 40 million years. So presumably, that's where all the transitional forms have gone, missing in those gaps of time. Or, as suggested by Gould and Eldridge, these evolutionary leaps could have happened so rapidly, at least in evolutionary time, that there wasn't a chance for any transitional fossils to get, well, fossilized. Either way, it sounds to me like no record, no evidence, not much proof of transitional forms. On top of that, there are some surprising new discoveries that have tilted the evidence in favor of a creationist interpretation. The general public is under the impression uh, that dinosaurs lived 65, 68 million years ago. That's what you find in the textbooks. That's what you find in the popular magazines. However, science has really outstripped that knowledge in the last 10 years or so. Why? Because we found soft tissue in many different specimens from different fossil sites all over the world. Uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, Mary Schweitzer from North Carolina State University began working with specimens at the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. And so what they found was a large T-Rex. And they excavated out the T-Rex, and they excavated out the femur, which is the long leg bone. And she soaked it in a weak acid called EDTA. And what that acid does is it dissolves away the bone mineral and it leaves whatever's inside that bone uh, undissolved. And in this case, uh, she found soft tissues. And the, the tech who did the, the dissolution for her pointed out, I'm finding soft tissue. I'm finding uh, something that's not characteristic of very old bones. And in this case, they think they're 68 million years old. So she had the tech repeat the experiment over and over and over and, and each time it produced this soft tissue. And what she found was actual blood vessels inside this femur that was fully mineralized and encapsulated, which would have protected those soft tissues over deep time. And she found what looked like red blood cells so using this immunohistochemistry, very sophisticated experiments, she proved the existence of these original biomolecules and biomaterials that go back to the original dinosaur. About five years ago, the Creation Research Society decided to mount a new project called iDino, the investigation of dinosaur intact natural osteotissue or bone tissue. And so we designed this project to go out and find dinosaur bones in the digs, in known fossil digs, to bring them back to the lab, to decalcify them, to put them in that weak acid, dissolve away the mineral, and see if we could find soft tissue inside the bones. On our last day, with only a few hours left, we found the largest 
Triceratops horn that was ever found on this ranch in the Hell Creek Formation. About 45 inches long, about nine inches in diameter, and it was buried three feet below the surface. We did the decalcification experiment, and what we found is really different from what Mary Schweitzer found. She found individual cells floating in the solution after she decalcified the bone in this weak acid. We found entire sheets of soft tissue. But we thin sectioned this and we found entire stacks of osteocytes inside this thick sheet of fibrillar bone material. So the question is, how do these very delicate, uh, very uh, specialized molecules and proteins survive 68 million years? Wait a minute, soft, flexible tissue from dinosaur bone? Now, how's that possible? According to the theory of evolution, dinosaurs walked the Earth over 100 million years ago. Could soft tissue inside a bone really exist for that long? So instead of making assumptions based on what's not in the fossil record, let's break it down and see what is there. 95% of those fossils are marine invertebrates. That's a huge portion of the fossil record. Of the 5% remaining fossils, the vast majority are plants, trees, and algae. Less than 1% of that 5% are vertebrates, creatures with a skeleton on the inside. First are fish, then the rest birds, dinosaurs, and last of all, mammals and humans. Which poses another question. Marine invertebrates in the middle of Colorado? <laughs> Seriously? You know, these fossils are scattered throughout the world and they are amazingly well-preserved. What's the explanation? This lowest level, this, this uh, salt mega sequence is called, or the Cambrian layers, sometimes these things go for miles and miles, go across the continent, go into the other continent, go around the world. It's understood nowadays as something happened which caused a inundation of the continent or whatever the land surface was, eroded off that great unconformity, and then began to lay down the sediments on top of that. Those sediments have hardened into sedimentary rock and the dead things have hardened into fossils. So the rock and fossil record is really an evidence of this water-based deposition of sediments that have become rock. Now we're getting a clearer picture of the story the fossil record tells us. There's evidence of a massive mud flow, the instantaneous burial of fossils, and finally, rapid wholesale devastation and death on a global scale. Where have we seen this before? Ah, yes, beautiful. Everything has this rosy glow. You know, appearances can be deceiving. Now, I could keep on wearing these glasses and claim that the whole world is rose-colored, but it wouldn't change the facts. The world just doesn't look that way. Sometimes the way people see the evidence depends on the glasses they choose to wear. I'd rather see the world the way it is. There's a story that matches the evidence we see here, and it comes from Genesis chapter 7. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered, and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, cattle, beasts, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. It looks to me like the evidence and the Bible are telling the same story. But even with the evidence on your side, you'll discover that this is a very unpopular viewpoint, one subjected to ridicule and abuse. But popularity has never had anything to do with the truth. Galileo and Dr. Ignaz Philipp Zimmelweis were two scientists who were ridiculed, even imprisoned, because the facts they discovered went against popular thought. For Galileo, it was for claiming that the sun was at the center of our solar system. For Dr. Zimmelweis, it was for trying to introduce hygiene into hospitals during the 1800s. Both of them were ridiculed, but they were right and popular science was wrong. Well, we've delved into the mystery buried beneath our feet and discovered the evidence of the fossil record. But the more we uncover, the more there is to know. For example, what about this great 
cataclysmic event, the one that created the record? Well, that's a journey for our next show. So join me for our next episode as we walk down the road of scientific discovery. Or maybe we should just take a boat. Why is it so hard for us to get behind us as, as a people, not us maybe here in this church? But maybe there are people here that aren't there yet. Why is it so hard for us to get behind the concept that the earth is as old as scripture tells us and no older? Anybody? Anybody want to hazard a guess as to why that's so hard for most people to get behind? Science, man. <laughs> science? <laughs> but we just watched the whole video on science. Because, well, we have a whole generation now that's not going to believe this because they will never teach them this. This will never be taught in schools. Not in public schools, anyways. So, right. I mean, maybe not as adults, but our younger generation, never. Never. Right. Okay. So, that, what's, what we're, we're being we're raised to, we're being taught this. hard to acknowledge a greater being than yourself. Because nowadays people are all about themselves, aren't they? <laughs> right? A lot of self. Anybody else before we kind of keep moving on? Okay. So the central verses here, I mean, the, all of chapter 7 in Genesis is relevant to what we just watched. Um, but the, the central verses are 7, 19, and 21. Um, I'll read them real quick. He, he did it at the end of the video. But, and the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. I threw in 20 and between 20 and 19 and 21. So everything died that was, that, that had the breath of life. I didn't go on, but if you read a couple more verses, it talks about everything that had the breath of life died. Fish, not all fish died. A lot of fish died because all that sediment was moving into the water. But a lot of fish survived. So, um, or at least we were led to believe that maybe some fish survived. So, what are the biggest problems uh, with the fossil record creates for evolution? Leaves out too much. No transitional figures, right? Leaves out too much. No transitional figures. There's a, there's a huge leap there. I mean, I've heard the argument, I don't know about you, but I've heard the argument, well, you have to make a leap of faith to believe in God. Well, okay, I do. Yes. Because I can't, I can't touch God. Or I can't see God right now. I can feel God right now, but I can't, I can't touch Him. And I can't see Him. But the evolutionists have to make that same leap of faith, don't they? Yes. So that goes into that whole question that he was talking about, about or, or a statement actually that they made, that evolution is a religion. Has anybody ever like, thought about that? Yes. Yeah? Evolution is a religion. The faith. It's a faith-based system. They have faith. They're believing that Darwin, who wasn't a straight-A student, by the way, I found out. <laughs> you know, they believe that what he came up with is, is fact. I mean, they're making the same leap of faith, aren't they? Maybe even bigger. Because there's more evidence that points to Scripture being correct than Darwin being correct. In what ways can evolution be considered a religion? We kind of walk through that, but does anybody else have anything else to add to that? Well, it can't be seen, it can't be reproduced, right. it can't be proven in a laboratory. So That's right. So it has to be taken by faith. Right. That's what religion is. A couple sessions back, we learned about that, right? Uh, Louis Pasteur could not reproduce. Right. He could not create life out of nothing. Right? He did that experiment. 
Do you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Couldn't create it, couldn't do it. And so, you're right. Anybody else? No? What supposed key ev evolu evolutionary evidence is missing from the fossil record? Somebody said it earlier, but the transition, right? So you've got all these layers. There's, what they say, 23 layers? 23 or 28? 23? 23. 23 layers. There's 23 layers. There is not one piece of transitionary fossil record in any of it. So what does that tell us? So when, when, you're, when you're talking with your friends, when you're sitting down with family, and, and you're discussing these things, and I hope that you are. I hope that, I hope that you don't just leave it here. I hope that you take this home, take it home to your grandkids, your children, who, friends, whoever. You're sitting around the coffee, you're sitting around the campfire. You're talking about this stuff. Bring it, bring it up. See what, I mean, throw, you know what they say, right? Throw it on the wall and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. Throw it on the wall and see what sticks. Because there's just no evidence of any transition. Yes, Jim? Hmm? What I was telling you about. I know a fella, his name was Sunderland. Mm -hmm. He was an aeronautical engineer. He designed the autopilot that all the planes have now. He was, he's an extremely uh, intelligent man. And it really bothered him that they were teaching evolution as fact in the New York State schools. So he went to the Board of Regents in New York State and harassed them about it and got permission to, under the auspices of the Re Board of Regents of New York State, to go to seven or eight, or six or eight major uh, museums in the world where they had large fossil collections mm -hmm. and went to each of those curators of those museums and said, show me what you have to support the evolution in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. None of them can do it. Right. So if somebody says, well, there's the horse, you know, that, that was one that uh, is in the textbooks. Mm -hmm. I think I remember that. Yeah. Uh, but all that horse come from different places all over the world, and they were di just different forms of horse. Right. That they mm -hmm. used to put together. Uh, there is there is no support in the fossil record of any transition. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's a very good point. There Robbie? isn't any support there, but that's what they're teaching our children. That's mm -hmm. what they're teaching the kids. Mm -hmm. and nothing ever came of it through the Board of Regents. They uh, just kind of got swept under the rug after all of the sure. effort that he did. He put into it on his own nickel. Right. Yeah, that sounds about right. Not right, but... It sounds about what would happen. Yes, John. The other thing he said, I think it's a little harder concept, but stasis, yeah. the idea of decay in that, uh, can only mean that this happened rapidly. However those fossils were embedded, uh, they didn't have time to decay. And right. so it, didn't, it wasn't millions of years and layers upon layers over millions of years. Right. Uh, because the decay just isn't there. Right. I mean, have you ever, have you ever buried anything? I, I, I know where you <laughs> well, but, but, be arrested. Yeah, <clears throat> but, but have you ever have you ever buried anything and then or, or left something out there, you know, that just, you know, a piece of meat, whatever it is, it doesn't just it doesn't just disappear and it doesn't just like compact down. And, you know, so it, it supports what you're saying is basically what, what I'm getting at is there's just there's no evidence that uh, there was this gradual building up of dirt around it. And then it compressed, and then it did all this. And I thought it was really fascinating because I hadn't actually, until I got to this series, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't discovered that or found out about the uh, soft tissue being found. Had anybody else heard about that? No, uh -uh. that's new. I mean, that's new. This is not new. This is, uh, I think, about 10 years old, this, this video series, actually. But I, now I want to go and do my own research and see how many more... Uh, so soft tissue samples have they found in dinosaur bones? And it, well, maybe, but I know of a really great resource at icr.org, <laughs> and, and there's a lot of uh, those guys are scientists too. So not it's, you know not every scientist is uh, is. Uh, 
uh, country. Mount St. Helen, that eruption, did you remember years ago? I do remember the eruption. I had a, watched a video once about that, how quickly um, that strata, that mm -hmm. as a result of that volcano, how quickly that formed and fossilized and all that. So it was not over millions of years. It was a relatively short time that all hours. of these layers that developed mm -hmm. and that hardened. And it was, I can't remember exactly, it was a long time ago I listened to it. But it just made me think about this millions and millions of years. It probably wasn't that long ago. You know what I mean? It's, that's what they're telling us, but it was much, probably much quicker than that. I'm guessing about 7,500 yeah. <laughs> years. Good guess. <laughs> More or less, give or take I mean, a few years. A, you know, recent um, evidence of that with the Mount St. Helen. It was yeah. a very interesting video. That's a, that's a great point. Yeah. Thank you. And that's another cataclysmic event that, that occurred. I thought, did, were you going to say something? No? no? Okay. Um, wasn't trying to put you on the I thought I saw your hand go up. Uh, why is it so hard for people to believe the Bible until they see evidence that proves it? Uh, we kind of talked about that a little bit already, but anybody else want to add to that? I think the consequence is, um, if there was a creator, then am I responsible for that creator? I mm -hmm. think it's easier to slide out from under the, the responsibility part, or right. the relationship. Either right, way. right. I think, I think that's, uh, I would say the exact same thing, a little bit different. I think that it's, we have trouble, we're, we're all about, we're kind of self-driven, aren't we? And to the fact that we are submissive to uh, a God that's greater than us is, is hard for a lot of people to, to grapple with. We're not, we're not the top. Well, even when they see the evidence, it says until they see the evidence, I think you can present the evidence, and unless God convicts them, they're not going to see the evidence. <laughs> but, the, but see, when we go back to that thing. Even though we have scripture, and, and if you believe that the scripture is God's word, then, then that's evidence to you, but it's not evidence... It's not the evidence that they're talking about. It's not that evidence where you can reach out and grab God's hand and hold his hand or, or that he can put his hand on you. I mean, he can, but we can't feel that right now. We don't have that. And so we're never going to be able to give them that concrete evidence, are we? Yes? So because what you're saying, there are two belief systems basically. Mm -hmm. If you believe in creation and Christianity, you have to come under the total authority of God, mm -hmm. His sovereign power. If I believe in evolution, I'm still my own boss. Right. And so the inherent way that men rebel and don't want to come under any authority, as we see throughout society now with government, school teachers, don't tell me what to do. It's so much, this is why they, they don't want to come under the authority of God. Mm -hmm. So, hey, this is out here. I'll go that way. But when I go that way, I'm still me, and don't tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And I right. can live my life. If I believe in creation, I believe in a higher power, and I'm subjected to his authority. And that's why they run the other way. They don't want to come under the authority. They want to be the proud. Free to be them. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's fantastic. And it ties back really tightly with uh, Sunday's sermon. The, the, author, the authorities in, in, in the home also relate to authorities between God and us. And, uh, and Pastor Jim really packaged that nicely. And so uh, if you think about it, those authorities are there. And it's the same authorities you're talking about. Right. Right. There's an order. It's There's an order. It's a, it's a specific order. If you mess with it, it doesn't work. Right. That's good. Yes. Uh, just another thing about the same question is mm -hmm. the deck's been stacked. For such a long time, Christianity has been painted as uh, not too bright people and uh, fables and myths. And uh, it's, it's, we're starting out below. We have to come up to level ground even with, in many people's minds because it's been painted that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so. It's easy for people to follow a different way because there's less pressure. Mm -hmm. The pressure is against the Bible and against the Christian. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just a reality. But we knew that was coming. If you've read anything in this book, we knew that was coming, didn't we? That he said it was going to be hard. Yes. 
right? Worse and worse. Worse and worse. And it wasn't going to be easy. We had to pick up our what and follow him, yeah. <laughs> right? Not easy. Uh, what are some simple questions you could ask your friends to get them thinking critically about the fossil record's implication for creation? Just a simple question that you could throw out there around the campfire tonight. What's true about the missing links? All right, the missing links, they're what's true? They're all missing. What's missing? Yeah. That's, a, that's a simple one. How about, where's, where's the evidence, where's the transitional fossil? Or just ask them, where's the, you know, if there's no proof, then is evolution a religion? How did the sea creatures get in the mountains? Yeah. You know, I was, uh, long ago I worked for the Border Patrol and I was in Texas, South Texas. And out in the middle of South Texas, just walking out there, I, I was tracking some folks. And, um, and, and there's fossils all over the place. There's fossils, there's fossilized trees, there's fossils everywhere out there. And there's seashells. In the middle, I mean, nobody picked them up and carried these seashells. There's seashells. Honest to goodness, seashells just sitting in the middle of the desert out there. Where'd those come from? I used to find them in Kansas on my grandparents' farm. Mm -hmm. Just walking out in the plains. Right. Yeah, maybe a seagull flew <laughs> thousands of miles and brought, this, brought those seashells. Yeah, and buried it in the rocks. Yeah, so I mean, it's just kind of crazy, right? You think about these, they're really simple questions if you think about it, aren't they? Any more, any, any thoughts? Yes? My thought is that the devil, Satan, has caused mankind to believe a lie. And mm -hmm. they are, unless God shows them the light, really strong. Our niece is a biologist and she is, we can't even talk to her. I just, because she just believes it so much and we are totally ignoramuses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she won't even listen to anything Jim has to say. Right. So I think it's Satan blinding them unless God opens their eyes. Well, they're not going to be able to see. That's right. I mean, we can, we can do our part, right? Which is the Great Commission, what we're supposed to do. And that's all we can do. God has to do the rest, and he will do the rest. Um, but it's, it's, everything belongs to him, not us, anyway. So, yeah. Amen. That's hard. That's a tough one. Yes, Jim? There's one thing that kind of got me and still sticks with me. Uh, many times, the way they determine what strata is the rocks that they're looking at, what strata that actually is. is they, they look at the fossils that are in there, and that tells them what strata it is. And then the people that study fossils, they look at the fossils in the rock. Uh, I can't explain that. Anyway, it's circle reasoning. Yes. Mm -hmm. you, you, you date the the rock by the fossils, the fossils by the rock. Yes. Right. Well, I, I used the, I called it a, a self-licking ice cream cone. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, I used the, that terminology, but that's basically what it is. It's a self-licking ice cream cone, and uh, they don't exist. But um, hey, I, I, we're kind of running out of time, and, I, and I'll, I'll be really quick about this, and I try not to be too uh, scientific on this, but who's heard of carbon-14 dating? A show of hands. You've heard of carbon-14 dating? So do you know what the half-life is of carbon-14? Because it, that's, you know, it's a radioactive, you know, isotope. Half-life of carbon-14? It's 5,240 years, roughly. So what that means is, is every 5,240 years, whatever amount of carbon-14 is in this book, we'll say, there should be half of that amount in 5,240 years, or whatever that amount of time is. So... Uh, in another 5,240 years, there'll be half of that amount. So, how are we finding carbon-14 in these dinosaur fossils, in all these fossils that we find? If they are millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years old, how do we find the carbon-14 in them? I personally do not believe in the carbon date. Okay. It's a flaw. Th there is some flaws in it, but if we were to just look at 
um, and I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing this straight out of the, the scientific papers out of the Institute for Creation Research's own kind of uh, material. But if we were to look at the carbon-14, and I, and I agree that there are some issues with carbon-14 dating, and, there, and the flaws are, 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 in, are introduced by like, they say, oh, well, there's water and all these other things that cause this, and that's how they, they kind of squirm out of, uh, of, of it, just like they squirm out of the transitional fossil record because they don't exist either. But the, the, my point was is that if dinosaurs are 68 million years old, if the fossil record is 68 million years old, there shouldn't be any carbon mm -hmm. left, carbon-14 left. Any, none, none. So first of all, how in the world are we finding soft tissue, right? And how are we finding so much carbon inside, carbon-14, excuse me, inside these fossils? Because they're not that old. They're not that old. I think they're like 7,500 years old, <laughs> give or take a couple hundred years. And if it hasn't come through yet, I believe that the earth is young. That God actually made the earth. That it, that we, which one? Ah. Right. I think that was, I remember exactly when I went to, when I was a new believer, when I went to creation research, and I read a simple children's book that talked about that. It was like, oh my gosh. I never thought of it. Death, you know, there could be no death. There, you know, because they, they say death could not have happened prior to, because it was his sin brought death. Right. And so, you know, so I was right. like, oh my gosh, that was like a revelation to me at that time. Right. Yeah. I have a question. Just yes, sir. John, you're much smarter than I am, especially oh. about the scripture. Okay. How long do you think, according to the scripture, that man has been on the face of this earth? 6,000 years. 6,000 years. That's what I think, too. And I've studied that some, mm -hmm. and I can't get anything else out of it. A lot of people say 6 to 10. They'll give it, to, you know, outside 10. But, uh, there's no record. There's no history. No, there is not. Prior to that. Yes. So yeah. from there, it's a leap. Well, if you divide it up from the time that the God created the earth, and the scripture gives us that, and the time frame that, that's in the scripture, it comes to about 6,000 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the flood is like 4,400, actually. Something like that, yeah. Do that, so. the, the evidence, as we're being taught, the evidence is in favor of a young earth and of the creation. There's, there's another thing, that verse that I read last week, week in First Peter, or Second Peter 3, uh, the idea of uniformitarianism, you mm -hmm. were just saying. There's a basic assumption of evolutionists that they can't assume. The Bible says it was a different earth pre-flood. And uh, so things did not, not even carbon-14 degenerated the same way pre-flood. We, we, we know that scientifically. So you cannot accurately date stuff because of that. Right. It, it's... Uh, but even, even because of the flaws, as you said, the stuff that has carbon-14 in it, potassium argon, there's a lot of them. But mm -hmm. yes. All right. so. so if you go by there, by the scientist's determination of that 5,000 years in between, there's no way it can be a fact. They all make a leap. That's the thing. <laughs> yes. Yep. 6,000, 7,000 years ago, you have to leap from there, and you can leap anywhere you want. I think it's a pretty big, big leap to go from 6,000 or 7,000 years to 68 million. Yes. Yes. A yeah. little bit. I mean, I don't know. I think it is. But what do I know? I'm just one of those yeah. illiterate Christians, yeah. right? Yeah. Anyway. Um, good stuff. This is good stuff. I, I, I just I can't get enough of, of, uh, of unlocking Genesis. It's, it's, to me, it's just amazing uh, all of the things that are right there in front of us. For us to, to just see and to be able to, to go, oh, okay. And I like the way that this guides us through. Um, it does a good job of guiding us through and, and, and talking through it. Um, any questions? Any thoughts going forward? Just one that you, that you already mentioned. And yes, that sir. Is, 
go to that site, you'll be shocked at all the information that's free and the video clips and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the ICR.org, I think. ICR.org. And it's amazing. I went there and, and I spent four hours when I was at work the other day. <laughs> yeah. It was just amazing. Hey, we're on video, John. <laughs> yeah. I'm salaried, no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is amazing. So, yeah. anyway, thank you, everybody, and we'll, we'll see you guys next week.